Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. As I, you know, read the uh, newspapers and, um, you know, watch the different television uh, documentaries and um, uh, programs, you get the impression that there's a growing number of um, highly educated people that sort of just reject the, the concept of God and, and the Bible and and that it's, you know, um, part of being educated today is to realise, well, the Big Bang explains how the universe came, the theory of evolution explains how life came, uh, we don't need uh, God. And you get the, you know, impression that to, to be a Christian and to believe the Bible is essentially, well, for people that, that don't know better. But really, when you look at science, that it couldn't be further from the truth because the more science delves in to what we know about this universe and our world and life, we just find so many more unanswered questions that don't fit any explanation on the basis of known science. In fact, in my mind, they point to God. They, they clearly point to God. When I uh, read in the, the Psalms, that um, um, a Psalm of David, Psalm number 19, we read uh, uh, just in the first few verses, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, that is the space, shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There's no speech nor language where the voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run his rates. Its rising is from one end of the heaven, and its circuit to the other end. There is nothing hidden from its heat. And there it goes on, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous together. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, much more than fine gold. And so here we have, uh, as I read this um, uh, psalm in the Bible, which was a psalm of uh, David, when we think uh, written um, over 3,000 years ago, this uh, psalm, and yet it sums up a couple of things. It, it points that the, the heavens, when we look at the, all the stars, they declare the, the glory of God. And uh, the space, the firmament, uh, shows his handiwork. And, of course, the, is the, the sun, the, uh, the rising of the, the sun, and has this circuit that goes around. And, of course, maybe we can think, well, we understand the Big Bang explained the universe. We know about the orbit of the sun and, and so forth. But did you know that there are so many unanswered questions, even about the sun, um, and uh, some of its its properties and its behaviour. But then it goes on and talks about the law of the Lord. And I think here it's talking about the, the moral law, the Ten Commandments of, uh, of God, that we're to have no other God before him and not to make any graven images or take his name in vain and to remember the Sabbath day and to honour our parents and to not commit adultery and to not commit murder and to to not steal and uh, to not lie and to not covet. And when you think about it, these basic laws provide for harmonious life and yet it seems that, again, people want to say, well, no, you know, morality just depends on, you know, the... The, the, the situation, it's up to people to decide, you know, what's honest, what's dishonest and, and, and so forth, when it's OK to, you know, steal from people or colloquially rip people off and, and so forth. And, um, and, and so people are going out and living their lives that way and we see the government are making laws associated. But when we look 
closely at this and, and go back the the heavens declare the glory of God. When we look at the, the physics, there are a whole lot of questions that are unanswered. And the, the big problem is that as people talk about the you know, the Big Bang Theory, dark energy, dark matter, all the, and, and different things, and the theory of evolution. These things are not proven entities. No one has proven that a new type of organism can evolve. No one has been able to demonstrate that. There's no known mechanism whereby a new viable genetic code can form. And no one has ever observed it happening, even though, that, for example, it bred bacteria through, you know, tens of thousands of generations. They they still just say stay the the same species of bacteria, and don't even change into a different type of bacteria. And it's the same when we talk about these things like you know, uh, dark energy and so forth. These are entities that physicists have have. Um, constructed to try and explain the universe and matter that we live in. So, um, for example, we uh, some of the things that physicists are working on are what we call grand unified theories. And these are an attempt to combine the uh, to combine an explanation for the three, uh, electromagnetic field type uh, forces that we have, the weak force, electromagnetism and the, and the strong force. And these, if we then try to combine that with gravity, that's called a theory of everything that physicists are trying to combine and explain how do these fundamental forces occur. But at the moment, of course, there's no quantum gravity theory that's been accepted and so... Uh, and again, we, we hear these terms, oh, well, there's quantum theory, and, and people use throw this word quantum around, you know, quite a bit. Well, you know, quantum theory bases on this, you know, probability that there's only probability of energy and matter being in particular uh, place at a particular time, divide, dividing it, and then we, and it has a wave function associated with this. In other words, and that's how we explain the connectivity between matter and, and energy. And this this wave function predicts the probability of the amplitude of and momentum, that's its mass and velocity of every piece of matter, every particle. And, of course, it applies to in very, very small space-time that we can't see in the world of the atom uh, down there. And uh, again, they're saying, well, is there, you know, a quantum theory of, of, of gravity? So one of the unsolved problems of uh, physics is, is there a theory of everything? Is there a theory which can explain the value of all the fundamental physical constants, of all the coupling constants, of all the elementary particle masses, um, and all the mixing angles of the, the different particles? So... And the other thing is, are there elementary particles that have not yet been observed? And if so, what are they and where are their uh, properties? Or are the fundamental particles that we um, observe and we have discovered by smashing atoms and particles down as far as we can, as I talked about you know, recently, are there fundamental particles that are actually composite particles too tightly bound to observe? Another fascinating area that we... Um, and Well, and going back... And so this is part of our attempt to understand what really is matter. Because matter is still a puzzling entity. As I said, these force fields are still a puzzling entity. What... What actually are these force fields that we call gravity, weak force, electromagnetism, that's electric fields, magnetic fields, and the strong force, the electromagnetic type of uh, force that occurs in, in the nucleus of an atom? And then, of course, there's the, the whole concept of, of time. Why does time have a direction? Why did the universe have such low entropy in the past 
and uh, time correlates with this universal increase in entropy. In other words, a state of disorder. So according to the Big Bang Theory, of course, there was more order in the past than in the future. There are all sorts of um, things. Is and, and these are things that, you know, everyday people, we carry on with our lives, but we don't think about the... These are actually real fundamental things that relate to why do we exist the way we are? Is the present moment of physical reality distinct from the past or the future? Or is it simply a property of consciousness? And is there a link between quantum time, the quantum arrow of time, to thermodynamic time. And so these are some of the deeper issues that physicists are trying to solve. But in many ways, they, they point to the existence of a creator outside God. Sometimes we see programs about the fine-tuning of the, of the universe. And this essentially says that the values of the fundamental physical constants are in a very narrow range and in that range that is necessary to support carbon-based life. Now the carbon atom has particular properties and that is that it has four unpaired electrons in its outer electronic shell which enables it to bond or form four bonds roughly as if it was at the centre of a tetrahedron. So this gives it the ability to make long chain-like structures as, as well as a huge variety of complex physical uh, shape type structures, which gives molecules that are formed from these chains of carbon atoms properties that enable life to exist. Um, so why should all these constants that are totally unrelated, you know, such as the gravitational constant and so forth, um, be such that it enables carbon and carbon-type compounds to, to form? Um, the, the time problem, too, comes up in a, you know, a number of um, areas. We have... Um, in general relativity theory that Einstein developed, time is just one component of four-dimensional space-time. So we, we, and this is something perhaps that, uh, as everyday humans, we can appreciate in that we have three physical dimensions: height, width, and length. And so we have the the three dimensions. Something is, um, you know, a physical object will be so high, it'll be so wide, and it'll be so long. And then we have time, and time is this one-dimensional, unidirectional, one-valued continuum that is just continually marching on. And that's in sort of, you know, our, our standard uh, time. But in general relativity, time is one component of this space-time, and the flow of time changes depending on the curvature of space-time and where how the observer is moving. And hence we, um, under relativity theory, of course, we know that the faster we travel, that time slows down. We get this time dilation effect. Um, but in quantum mechanics, um, it's universal and absolute, the flow of time. So here we have two competing theories again that have two different models of time. Then we have um, this whole idea of, uh, you know, that is promoted all the time of cosmic inflation. Um, and so what is the, the, the scale of field or what type of field caused energy to expand and, and produce the universe? It's... Um, and then we have the horizon problem. Why is the distant universe, that is the, the outermost parts of the universe, the furthest away parts of the universe that we can observe, why are they so uniform? Why are they so homogeneous? When the Big Bang theory actually would seem to predict large amounts of 
of, of differences, unevenness, what we would call any, um, anisotropies. But um, one of the things that is generally accepted, of course, is, is cosmic inflation, that somehow the universe expanded much faster than the, the speed of light. And this leads us to these, um, what we call a cosmological constant uh, problem. And if you look at uh, what physicists at the moment estimate, in order for their Big Bang theory to work, they have to say, well, the universe is only composed of about 5% ordinary matter. And we've got nearly... 27% dark matter, and then we have the balance, around 68%, dark energy. Now, why is it dark? Because we don't know anything about it. But in order to solve our equations, the mass of the universe must be made up of uh, energy component. 68% of the mass of the universe must be made up of this energy component. And again, when you think about it, these are explanations. We have no idea what this dark energy is. We can't measure it, but yet it has to be there. Otherwise, there, there can't be an explanation for the universe. Now, to me, if this doesn't point to the evidence for a supernatural creator God outside the laws of physics and space-time, it's... Um, you know, to me, it's just powerful, um, powerful evidence. So, the, the cosmological constant, which is often you know talked about in cosmology, it, it's essentially is a, um, it's the energy density that causes the expansion of the universe to accelerate. Why is the universe accelerating? Why does it appear to be according to the redshift? Um, in, in effect, I suppose, this energy density, and that's what they call this, this dark energy, which, again, has to be the equivalent of uh, 68%. That's a huge amount of the energy in the universe. So what we're saying is, I guess to break it down in simpler terms, is that if we want to, with just regular physics, explain how the universe is and can be, we have to invoke something like 95% dark energy and dark matter that we don't know about, that we don't exist, but it has to be there. And to me, if you know that's not a fairyland-type explanation of how we come to be here, then I don't know what is. When you've got to have 95% of the matter and energy in the universe, dark energy and dark matter, to explain our existence apart from God the Creator. But if we have God the Creator, God, this is what God created. Um, and so these are some of the, the problems in physics that we face that to me point so powerfully to the existence of the supernatural God that David was talking about in the Psalms, that the universe displays his handiwork. And if people think that physicists have explained the universe, they are very wrong. We just don't know. We just can't explain. As we look at these structures, we there, there's just so much that amazes us uh, as we look around. And the other thing is that you know, one of the fundamental questions, and often we think, is how did the conditions for anything to exist arise? And, um, and, and again, if we come back to this dark matter, what is dark matter? Is it a particle? Is it some super light, you know, particle? Um, is it a, an extension of gravity? Um, you know, what, what is it? These are some of the questions that physicists are trying to grapple to hold on to this Big Bang theory. Otherwise, it collapses. There's, there's, it, they've got nothing. Another one is dark energy. What actually is the cause of the observed uh, accelerated e expansion of the universe? Now, it's very interesting. 
the Psalms talk about and Isaiah talks about how God stretched out the universe. The Bible clearly points, and remember, these these Psalms were written, as I said, the Psalms of David 3,000 years ago. Um, we're looking at Isaiah, you know, 2,600, 2,700 years ago. Um, and yet they're saying, God stretched out the universe. And here's science to say, whoa, hang on, we, we've got to have this dark energy. Um, and why is the energy density of the dark energy component of the same magnitude as the density of matter at the present when the two, those according to their theory, evolve quite differently over time? Yeah. The, again, when they look at solving the equations, it just points to so many inconsistencies in, in the model. And yet that's what people cling to and try to discredit on the, the, the Bible, on the, the basis of these uh, sorts of, of theories. And um, often we hear, you know, terms like vacuum energy and this sort of thing. And we may need to remember this is not the – when scientists talk about these uh, sort of uh, situations, you know, uh, quantum fluctuation in a vacuum, they're not talking about like just – as we have with a vacuum pump, you suck out all the molecules in a particular space and you get to lower and lower and lower and lower pressure till there's essentially no matter in there. What they're talking about is a um, in particle physics, a vacuum refers to the ground state or the lowest configuration of, um, the, of the wave function. And um, so, again, there's still talking about matter, they're still talking about energy. They're not actually talking about nothing itself. Um, they, they use these terms and of course these can lead in the minds of people and particularly popular journalists that write articles about this that you know science has, a, has an explanation for how we came to be, how the universe came to be, but far from it. There's another interesting thing, and uh, that is, is there some sort of non-spherical, symmetrical gravitational pull from outside the observable universe responsible for some of the observed motion of large objects such as galactic clusters in the universe? And this is quite interesting. In other words, there we see the effects on a gigantic, gigantic scale. And we need to remember that gravity is relatively a weak force. It becomes very powerful at, at very, very short ranges. But on a large scale, it's, it's a relatively weak, weak force. But when we, again, look, there are these huge structures in the universe that are being pulled in particular directions. Um, Another fascinating thing, and, and I think this is, is quite, um, quite relevant and a clue, and that is that some of the large features of the microwave sky at a distance of over 13 billion light years. So the, what, what they're saying is that they, they calculate on the basis of redshift um, data and so forth that the universe is about 13 billion years old, 13.8 billion years old. So that means that light, theoretically, we shouldn't be able to see light further away than 13 billion light years, right? Because the universe isn't that old. But what they find is that we're, we're detecting microwave radiation that is coming at distances that they calculate as further away than that. And they're coming from, from structures that seem to be aligned with the motion and orientation of the solar system. In other words, these are special effects that are happening that seem tuned to us. And as I said, these are giant structures out right out at the, the limit of the observable universe, right? And when we think, you know, we're, we're just one part of, of trillions of galaxies, right, that are in our universe, why should these giant structures that seem to be outside the universe 
be aligned to the motion and structure and plane and orientation of our solar system. And to me, this is a clue. This is, you know, as the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. To me, here we have, as we're exploring space, as we're making this discovery, it's almost like God saying, don't you know you're special? Don't you know that I've made the earth special? And it just fits the Genesis account there that God made this universe special for us, that we are special. We're made in the image of God. You know... There are some really large structures in the universe, much larger than an experiment. And the current cosmological models say that there should be very little structure on scales larger than a few hundred million light years. But the Sloan Great Wall is 1.38 billion light years in length. So this is a structure in the universe that's 1.38 billion light years in length length. And the largest structure currently known is the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall, which is up to 10 billion light years in length. And there's no way on the basis of probability that these could be random structures formed in that time. And that these structures contradict so many other aspects of how, if there was a Big Bang theory and things formed just randomly, how could these amazing structures, especially structures so huge, uh, 10 billion light years in length and size, form? These are just some of the things that I think clearly point that when we know about science... Science is pointing to God, the creator, the God of the Bible. And that's the God that the Hebrews worship, the God that Jesus came as God, as man, to bring people back to again uh, before he comes again, um, to point people to there is a loving God, a loving creator God. We were made special. We were given minds where we can discern these structures, understand physics. And that's the God of the Bible. You've been listening to Faith and Science. And remember, if you'd like to listen to this program and other programs, you can uh, uh, go to um, Google them on the web. Just Google 3abnaustralia.org.au and click on the listen button. I'm Dr John Ashton. Have a great day. been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.